Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is John Griffin, uh, and I'm the faculty director of the CU Boulder Conference on World Affairs here on the campus, or CWA. Uh, the CWA is a week-long festival of ideas, free and open to the public, held on this campus every spring. This year's conference uh, will be held uh, Tuesday, April 9th to Saturday, April 13th, Tuesday to Saturday this year. So, uh, so mark your calendars, and uh, we hope that you'll join us for what's shaping up to be a fantastic 71st year of the CWA. Uh, the CWA is honored to be collaborating with the law school on today's homecoming panel, Foreign Policy and the Rule of Law, the third edition of the John and Catherine Rosenblum Endowed Lectureship here at CU Law. I want to thank John and Kathy for their tremendous support of both the law school and the CWA. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Marcy Fulton, Julianne Williams uh, from the law school, as well as Aaron Rain, Katie Grady, and Alan Culpepper from CWA for all their work on uh, today's event. Um, if you would, John and Kathy, just stand up briefly so that we can thank you and show our appreciation. <clears throat> <clears throat> so it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of uh, today's uh, panel discussion, uh, who is the Dean of CU Law, uh, Jim Anaya. Uh, a graduate of Harvard Law School, uh, Dean Anaya has written extensively on international human rights and issues concerning indigenous peoples. Among his numerous publications are his acclaimed book, Indigenous Peoples and International Law uh, from Oxford University Press, and his widely used textbook, International Human Rights, Problems of Law, Policy, and Process, which is in sixth edition. What struck me in reviewing uh, Dean Anaya's impressive list of publications is that his work has explored both how the law of indigenous peoples has been affected by international law, but also how it has contributed to uh, international law. Over the course of uh, his illustrious career, Dean Anaya has advised numerous indigenous organizations and has represented indigenous groups in landmark cases before both domestic and international tribunals, including the United States Supreme Court, and the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. Uh, Dean Anaya participated in the drafting of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and as UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from 2008 to 2014. He monitored the human rights conditions of indigenous peoples worldwide and addressed situations in which their rights were being violated. <clears throat> In 2014, Dean Anaya was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. For his many accomplishments, Dean Anaya was recently named a distinguished professor, the highest honor that the University of Colorado bestows on its faculty, higher even than CWA faculty director. <laughs> <clears throat> so with that, I will yield the floor to Dean Anaya, and I hope you enjoy today's conversation. Th thank you, John. Um, I, I didn't expect you to go on so so much about, about my bio. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, we're very pleased to be partnering with the Conference on World Affairs for for this event. And uh, let me also mention that John is actually a graduate of law school, so it's fitting that that he's uh, we're partnering with him as director uh, this homecoming weekend. So I don't know where we went, but I wanted to say welcome back, John, to the law school, um, and to all the alumni. To back to the campus for uh, this homecoming weekend and for this event, uh, welcome to you. I'd also like to extend a welcome to uh, those who've made it uh, to the law school for this event through their affiliation or knowledge about the, the CWA, which truly is a, a great, terrific program at, at our university. And finally, I'd like to reiterate thanks to John and Kathy, Rosie and Bloom for uh, sponsoring uh, the, this, this event through the endowment that they have created for our lectures series at uh, our homecoming events. And the, these lectures have, have truly contributed to what we've been able to do at the law school uh, during the homecoming weekend. So thank you again, uh, John and, and, and Kathy. Um, so with that, let's, let's turn to the reason uh, that we're here this afternoon. Uh, today, uh, the world faces serious challenges to the dominant model uh, 
of the rule of law and its connection with global integration. In an effort to increase peace, freedom, and prosperity, countries throughout the world, individually and collectively, uh, have managed to engage in a wide range of rule of law reform initiatives. Now, these initiatives generally follow the Western model of democracy and are geared toward building institutions, enhancing civil liberties, dampening crime, and facilitating market economies. Uh, the United States has made part of its foreign policy the promotion of democracy and the rule of law around the world, especially in, pre in countries previously under the influence of the old Soviet Union and countries emerging from conflict or despotic rule. But how successful are those rule of law reform efforts in achieving their goals? And are the necessary long-term institutional reforms occurring? What impacts do the policies and practices of the United States have on efforts to promote the rule of law globally? These are among the questions that our panelists will be tackling today. Uh, I'm going to let our panelists say further about uh, their backgrounds. Their bios are in your programs. I invite you to refer to those. Um, but let's now, uh, I'd invite you now to join me in welcoming them uh, to, to the room. First of all, James Caballaro, a professor of law, Stanford Law School, director of Stanford Human Rights Clinic. James? Jim, where are you? There oh, you are. This was there. <laughs> Coming out of a door oh, through a um, curtain, uh, very mysteriously, kind of. Hey, not expecting this. Hey, 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 hey. Also with us this afternoon is uh, Robert Dreyfus, a contributing editor of The Nation magazine. Robert? Bob? And finally, Emilia Justinia Powell, Associate Professor of Political Science uh, with a concurrent appointment at the law school there at the uh, University of Notre Dame. So you've heard the setup for the panel. Um, so why don't you each give, a, give some uh, opening commentary uh, about the, the topic of today, and, and also say a little bit more about your backgrounds. Um, I think the, the program may have bios and stuff, but I'm a journalist. I've been working freelance for a bunch of magazines for the past 25 or 30 years, um, mostly conservative <laughs> magazines like Rolling Stone and The Nation and <laughs> Mother Jones and The New Republic and, and so forth. Um, and uh, I've traveled a lot around the world, but mostly I wrote during most of that time from uh, Washington, D.C. And I've, I've covered everything, but I've done a lot on national security issues, especially um, since 9-11. But even before that, I did reporting about the CIA and the intelligence community and about various law enforcement questions. And then um, since then, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, the wars, the war on terror, uh, I've been to Iran a couple of times, um, done reporting from there. Um, so um, I think we're going to have like a discussion and a dialogue or a trialogue among all of us about this question. Um, I think there's a, a kind of a, a contradiction between the ideals of the United States and the, the, the practice of the United States. Um, I, there's a lot of ways we could approach that, but I, let me just start by saying, if you think back over the last 20 years, just that section, um, there were many both practical and legal and foreign policy questions raised around the uh, US bombing campaign in Yugoslavia during the uh, Kosovo-Serbia conflict, right? And a lot of people, including me, uh, but many lawyers and other people argued at that time that um, this was an illegal action, that it was not authorized by the United Nations, that it was a unilateral US slash NATO operation that among its effects had the effect of riling up nationalists in Russia who have long, for centuries of course, been allied to 
Serbia through the church and other means. Um, then came 9-11 and the US invasion attack on Afghanistan, um, which I and many others was both counterproductive and unnecessary, that it could have been handled on a police and intelligence response aimed specifically at Al-Qaeda and the perpetrators, not at the Taliban government and certainly not at the whole country of Afghanistan. And now, uh, 18 years later, we're still, there are people actually enlisting in the military now who were not born on, on the day that we invaded Afghanistan. Um, and the subsequent war on terror raised many, many legal questions about whether it was justified, whether the authorization to use military force, the OMF, was uh, a proper response, and whether the military was a proper tool to be used to fight what is essentially uh, a war of ideas, a war against an idea, uh, namely terrorism. Uh, and that has expanded like Topsy now to several continents and dozens of countries that have been um, uh, 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 you know, assaulted by various things like drone attacks. The drone war itself raises questions about uh, legality. Um, you may recall that five years ago, President Obama gave a speech saying, oops, we better fix this. Uh, maybe these drones aren't the best thing to do. We better try to avoid civilian casualties. And the so-called signature strikes, which was, we don't really know who we're attacking, but it looks like he could be a bad guy. Um, the Trump administration is now kind of reversing that and easing up the rules again. But in either case, a lot of questions were raised about that. And, and most of all, the war in Iraq um, was considered by many from Kofi Annan on down to be um, both criminal and illegal. Uh, illegal in the sense that it was, again, a unilateral uh, <laughs> attack. Um, what um, people have called predatory internationalism or um, certainly um, has led to onerous consequences over the past 15 years. And all of these things raise questions in my mind and I, I hope in yours, uh, not only because of the consequences of the acts themselves, but to the extent to which then China's militarization of the South China Sea or the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea, um, one of the few actual territorial uh, acquisitions by force in recent history, um, were both justified on the basis of, hey, the United States does this stuff, so you know, why can't we throw our military muscle around, especially in our backyard, which in, in the case of Ukraine and the South China Sea, both countries considered to be uh, in you know, their jurisdiction. So I think that to the extent that the United States believes in and defends and supports um, those kinds of, uh, th that, uh, you know, a kind of ideal of, of humanitarianism, defense of human rights, and the rule of law, what academics these days are calling the rules-based international order, um, uh, I'm not so sure it's really that rules-based, is it? And um, I heard Jake Sullivan the other day at NYU Law School speaking on this topic. He was Hillary Clinton's shadow secretary of state, except, oops, what happened two years ago. And uh, he, he called it the liberal international order, and he pointed out that many conservatives don't like either any of those three words. Um, uh, so, okay, that's a funny line. But meanwhile, do, do we really have a liberal international order or do we have a world in which the United States rules um, on a might makes right uh, basis? And um, uh, so anyway, that's my opening thoughts. And Thank you, Bob. Bob certainly hasn't pulled any punches and uh, laying down the, some fundamental questions about the rule of law on a global scale. Um, uh, Emilia, uh, your opening statement. Um, so I'm an associate professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame with concurrent appointment um, at the law school. 
and my specialty is international law, international courts in particular, as well as the Islamic legal tradition, um, the Sharia. So uh, both of those topics uh, of my research as well as teaching seem to be quite of interest those days um, because I feel like both international law is misunderstood and misused and politicized by states and policymakers. Um, and so is the Islamic legal tradition. It's misused, thrown in there without uh, real thought as to what um, <coughs> Islam actually is. So I feel like the title of this panel here, Foreign Policy and the Rule of Law, what does it mean? What comes to my mind is, is the phrase international law. How, how international is international law? Who came up with those rules? And are all of the countries in the world able to contribute equally to the construction of those rules? I've traveled a lot uh, because of my research to the Middle East and to the Muslim majority countries. And what I hear is, it's yours international law. It's the Western international law. We don't have anything to say. And if, so uh, I hear from the policymakers in the Muslim countries, if we want to say something, then we are silenced or um, interpreted as being backwoods, pretty much. So. How, how global is that international law? Who sets the rules? So this is one question that comes to my mind when I'm thinking about international law or rule-based global order. Are those rules unbiased? And why is it that some countries have the ability and are, considerate, <coughs> co consider, uh, are considered to be legitimate rule makers, and why do some other countries have to import those rules and accept them as is? Is that really legitimate? Is it the way it's supposed to be? And why is it when when US violates the rules, it's somehow more OK than if some other countries do it? The second thing that comes to my mind deals with institutionalized international law, so international courts. Because I'm thinking, well, if states are to abide by rule of law, it means that everybody, all the states, around 200, are equal. And they're supposed to be equally subordinate to those sets of rules. But what does the United States do? Really, the relationship between the US and international courts have, has been on shaky grounds. I'm thinking about two international courts, the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. <coughs> so when two countries have a dispute, they're supposed to go to the International Court of Justice and not fight it out. Yet, here recently, really since the 70s, but it's escalated even more. The United States has been quite unsupportive on the, of the International Court of Justice. And just two months ago, um, policymakers, US policymakers have called the International Court of Justice um, a politicized and ineffective institution. Every time the court speaks against the United States, then the United States, oh, you illegitimate. <coughs> well, what does it mean for international rule of law? What do other states are supposed to think about international courts if the United States is saying, you're bad? And then international criminal court, a court that's supposed to be the guardian of international criminal law. So fight things like genocide, crimes against humanity. Again, the United States is, is saying, um, you're illegitimate. We're going to let you die on your own. Well, what signal does it send to the autocratic countries or countries where rule of law domestically 
is much less present. It sends a really um, questionable signal. Great, thanks. Another <coughs> set of uh, thought-provoking comments. Um, James Cavallaro, Jim. Uh, <coughs> so thank you, Dean and I, and uh, thank you, everyone, for your presence and, 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 and patience. Uh, so just a bit of context first. My background uh, is in human rights. I teach at Stanford Law School, but mostly I run the Human Rights Center and the Human Rights Clinic. Uh, and my background is in, in human rights practice uh, in the Western Hemisphere. I've done some work in other parts of the world, but mostly in the Western Hemisphere, mostly in the Americas. Uh, and most recently, I served on the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is a part of the OAS, and it oversees human rights conditions in the Western Hemisphere. You have bios. But I say that because I'm, uh, compared to the views so far, I think I'll just sort of add a bit of perspective from the Americas. Uh, so first, I, I agree with <coughs> excuse me, pretty much everything that's been said. Uh, Dean and I have started by asking us to ex assess the extent to which rule of law policies by the United States are effective. And I think a prior question, which has been uh, implicitly, if not explicitly, raised by my two colleagues on the panel is, to what extent are the, is the idea of rule of law actually substantially uh, a core part of the United States foreign policy? Right? So, and I think it's a prior question. Before you assess whether the policies are effective, are those policies sincere? Are they authentic? Uh, are they instead uh, a discourse that is useful, that uh, may actually expand the United States' power in the world? The idea of a beacon on a hill, the idea that the United States stands for uh, democracy, liberalism, uh, et cetera, <clears throat> that may actually be, in the most cynical interpretation, uh, a move, a deliberate move by the United States to enhance its real politics. Right, that if the United States cloaks itself in the discourse and the appearance of rule of law, of justice, of democracy, then, it, then it's able to achieve its actual foreign policy interests more effectively. Uh, so, and there, just to feed in a few more elements, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll put a, a, a clawback clause, as it were, which is a human rights term on that assertion. Uh, so, you know, if we look at sort of in broad strokes, the Second World War, uh, the Nuremberg trials are, I think, understood in 2018 fundamentally to be about crimes against humanity. They weren't. They were about aggressive war. That was the, the fundamental crime to which war crimes and crimes against humanity attached. So the Nuremberg precedent really was about aggressive war being the most important international crime. That said, since Nuremberg, the United States, in effect, has abdicated from any uh, pretense of being constrained by the norm against aggressive war. And the most recent examples, Afghanistan, Iraq, elsewhere, where in, the United States invades other countries uh, without uh, United Nations authorization, a violation of the prohibition on aggressive war. Second, the United States, <clears throat> really prior to the Second World War, implemented imperfectly the Supremacy Clause. The Supremacy Clause in the United States Constitution makes treaties the supreme law of the land. That is, in effect, dead letter. There's a great book by David Sloss on this, and maybe on Q&A we can get into that. But the core idea is that the United States is the ultimate arbiter of law. The Supreme Court is the ultimate arbiter, arbiter of law. And the United States ratifies treaties, and when they do, they attach RUDs, reservations, understandings, and declarations, which in effect say, no matter what we ratified, nothing actually is going to bind us except what the Supreme Court and the Constitution and the laws of the United States hold us to. And then third, with the United States, a major trend on the issue of the rule of law is the idea of accountability. The United States promotes accountability everywhere else in the world, <laughs> except for the United States and its actions. We are never accountable. I mean, it really is remarkable. If you look at the history of the United States, you can't find significant accountability for the actions of US forces or US authorities. And right now, we're seeing the full-on recycling and re-legitimation of 
all of the neocon figures that gave us the Iraq War. They, uh, they, they, you see them on MSNBC. Forget about Fox and, 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 and other channels. Okay? And, and that's part of a history of non-accountability for U.S. authorities and even for, for mid-level and lower-level forces. And the whole discourse against the ICC is all about the idea that the ICC might hold U.S. forces responsible for war crimes. Mm -hmm. the Imagine being the International Criminal Court. I, I'm yeah. sorry, the International yeah. Criminal Court. Okay, so I think that sets the table and we're in agreement. Now, here's what makes, I think, this debate complicated, interesting, and uh, problematic. And that is, in the instances when the United States seeks to promote the rule of law, and it does sometimes, it actually can have a significant impact. It can actually make a difference. Even if we all agree, and we may not, but even if we all agree, fundamentally the United States foreign policy promotes the interests of the United States. And the rule of law is used as a facade uh, because it maximizes the power discursively and actually uh, materially of the United States. Even if we agree to that, the United States sometimes engages to promote the rule of law and democracy in different countries around the world. And the United States sometimes is constrained by its own discourse. And when the United States acts to promote the rule of law in different countries, it can have a remarkable impact in those countries. Mm -hmm. I see this from the Latin American perspective. You know, the line in Latin America is the United States sneezes and Latin America gets a cold. Mm -hmm. The United States takes a, some minor action it decides this or that on TPS, and it's a national crisis in El Salvador. Uh, temporary protected status, not uh, turning back people who have temporary protected status or not. And it creates a crisis in El Salvador or Honduras. The United States questions the legitimacy of outcome, uh, the legitimacy of, a, of an electoral outcome because it's a fraud or doesn't. And that government stays in power or doesn't stay in power. The Honduran government, which was elected through fraud, fraudulent elections, it's in power because the United States at the end of December, right around Christmas, issued a statement saying, no problem here, even though every electoral observer of consequence uh, documented uh, those elections as fraud. So even though in the broad stroke uh, visual of the United States foreign policy in the world, I would say the rule of law is not the top priority. It sometimes is a priority. And when it is, in, in certain cases, in certain instances, US intervention can have a significant consequence. And when it's not, those consequences can be quite deleterious. And now what we're seeing is, I think, a government that does not even purport to care about the rule of law or democracy. We have a government that has effectively recently embraced its nationalist, read, ethno-nationalist nature, uh, a government that is uh, planning to send 800 troops to the border, what, to fire on women and children seeking political asylum, uh, a, a, a government that has not even uh, deigned to accept a verbal commitment to the rule of law, a government that is, was in full-on uh, cover-up and protection mode for the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, if, who committed one of the most heinous individual incidents in recent record. Again, this is a country that is bombing Yemen and creating a massive crisis in Yemen. But on the incident, the Khashoggi incident, you have a, a US government that is turning a blind eye because they buy a lot of military products from us. So we're at a stage where, if we all agree, the broad strokes of US foreign policy is not fundamentally about rule of law. I would argue there is a significant residual amount that is about the rule of law, or could be, and when it is, there are consequences, but now we seem uh, to have abandoned even that residual layer of uh, engagement with the rule of law and promotion of democracy. Thank you all. Um, uh, Jim, you and Bob particularly have seemed to have argued that, that the U.S. is really not constrained by the rule of law and its foreign relations. And we're talking in this context, uh, or in, in that regard, about international law. Um, that is that body of rules that uh, it is presumed to apply uh, in international relations uh, as between states and also those rules that apply that states agree to that sometimes apply internally like human rights law and uh, Amelia has questioned the legitimacy of international law um, putting that question aside in some ways uh, 
because of its Western orientation. And that's a critique that has, we've, that, that has been around for some time, but now I think it has a certain uh, saliency given uh, current events uh, and the issues uh, that have, have dominated um, concern globally in recent times, particularly with regard to the Middle East and Islamic countries. Um, are we to take from this that, that there really uh, is no legitimate <laughs> international law? Uh, yeah, uh, I, you know, I've, as all of us, I think, have ta 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 thought a lot about international law. We've thought a lot about its rules. Uh, even Bob, I think, here has, has, take, has, has made the effort to interpret those rules. Um, and when we do that, and we interpret rules and apply them, that there's a presumption that we, we think that they matter in some way. Um, but how far do they matter? That's what I want to get to. Do, is there really a body? Of I, think you can, I think you can find many instances where the world has gotten better and that international law has played a role in that. And, you know, I'm sure everyone could come up with their own examples, but I would point to the issue of civilian casualties in war. Um, first, I should pick up on what Jim said. I mean, we have a current administration which has, you know, broken with the Iran agreement, broken with the Paris Climate Accord, pulled out of, I mean, has with a whole series of, of steps, right, has, has chosen to invalidate um, on the grounds of national sovereignty or something or other um, all of these different national systems. National security. And, and um, this is a president who, by the way, has also launched a full-scale attack on the domestic rule of law, attacking the intelligence community, the FBI, the just, Justice Department, the courts and judges themselves, personally even, um, as part of an all-points defense against the Russia inquiry and other things. Um, but if you look at the issue of civilian casualties, um, it wasn't too long ago in World War II that mass warfare against civilians was considered the way war happened. Um, you all read, I'm sure, Kurt Vonnegut's story about the Dresden bombing in Germany, the Tokyo uh, uh, fire bombing, which killed 100,000 people in one day, uh, not to mention the atomic attacks on Japan, which led also to several hundred thousand casualties. Um, as things moved on after that, and as the UN was created, and as there was an attempt to um, actually create some sort of rule of law in, in the world, including rules of warfare, I think you've seen a, a broad international consensus that civilian casualties are ruled out as part of, of uh, warfare. And when they happen, then they become uh, significant events. Um, uh, I did a major full issue of the nation about five years ago on called America's Afghan Victims. And it was an attempt to add up how many people had been killed in Afghanistan due to um, the war there over the course of, <coughs> at that time, 12 years. Um, as you may know, the, the military said, we don't do body counts, and they absolutely refused to give any estimates since 2001 of how many people have died in Afghanistan, period. They don't do it. Uh, the UN tried to do a count, but it was extremely hard to count the dead in Afghanistan for many reasons I could go into, but it's extremely hard, bordering on impossible. Um, the, the Pentagon, uh, and I worked then in doing this with uh, a group called CIVIC, um, which, which was uh, Innocent Victims in, in Conflict. It's now called Center for Civilians in Conflict. Um, they worked with the Pentagon to try to come up with rules that would improve how many civilians died in, in war. And the Pentagon continually refused to create an office, uh, which many people demanded, an office that would specifically train our soldiers, train our commanders um, to avoid civilian casualties in, in conflicts. And in Afghanistan, they came in many, many ways, not just from the air raids, which was the initial thing, but then uh, at checkpoints and other things, and then later through drone attacks. Um, now that we've pulled out most of our forces from Afghanistan, um, 
the air power is increasing again and civilian casualties are rising um, because of the air power it's much more indiscriminate than on the ground troops. Um, you could say the same about the whole history of drone warfare and the question of civilian casualties. Um, again, this is not something we can pin uh, on, on Trump. This is something that happened under Bush and Obama and grew and expanded under both of those presidents. And you mentioned Yemen, Jim. It was, of course, it was Obama's administration that endorsed and supported the Saudi and UAE attacks on Yemen, providing um, intelligence, targeting, and uh, the bombs themselves um, for this massive campaign that has caused many civilian casualties in, in Yemen. Uh, part of the reason we don't track that is because nobody is on the ground, really. I'm talking about journalists like me and others. Uh, to, to track it. I, I saw a meme t today on Facebook that said, first they came for the journalists, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a journalist. After that, I didn't say anything because I didn't know what was happening. <laughs> um, that's kind of the case in Afghanistan. It's kind of the case in Yemen, certainly in Somalia and other places. We don't know. But I think, going back to my initial point, there has been a sharp reduction. We're not bombing cities anymore. We're not doing massacres of, of tens or hundreds of thousands of people at a stroke when we go to war. And um, maybe we can later get into the question of humanitarian interventions to protect people, which is a very thorny topic that started with Rwanda, I guess, in the last 20 some years, but has become a big topic in many, many other areas of conflict. So I, I think there is an important role for both international norms and then for specific um, legal you know, codifications of those kind of things that try to reduce um, the harm that's caused by, uh, by conflict. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, uh, I teach international law. So to me, international law is a um, vibrant legal system. <coughs> and it's really unfair when we're trying to compare international law to domestic law. They're just different animals. And so my answer is very simple. International law does exist. And most, most countries um, listen to international law most of the time. Now, when the violations are taking place, they are publicized and they are criticized. And the fact that policymakers use terminology of international law to justify their violations and phrase them as non-violations is the proof that international law matters to them, that they care. Um, so wh when we think about um, territorial disputes, when countries argue over territory, these are dangerous disputes. Um, they often lead to militarized uh, outcome, casualties, and uh, when those disputes end up at the International Court of Justice, um, about 90% of those judgments are complied with. 90%. That's actually stunning in decisions that countries are furious about because the court is saying, look, this piece of land is yours um, and this piece of land is not yours. Yet in almost 90%, states listen to it. Sometimes people... Um, criticize international law, pointing to its ineffectiveness by saying, oh, look, so many states violate it. Well, Notre Dame is located close to Chicago, and every weekend we have about, in Chicago, 70 violent shootings. Well, does it mean that there's no criminal law in Chicago? Well, no. Uh, it means is that in, in, in some parts it's just not well enforced. So the same can be said about international law. Just because several states uh, violate it, and especially when a big power such as the United States is flagrantly violating some of its um, uh, norms, then everybody hears about it. But it doesn't mean that the entire framework doesn't exist. Because international law uh, evolved from states practice. So states did certain things, and over time, it became um, a norm of international law, such as um, humanitarian law or laws of warfare. 
So uh, to me, international law absolutely is a reality. Jim. Yeah, I think uh, the two answers have been quite sharp and lucid. And, and what I would add, I was going to use an analogy to uh, uh, some other area of domestic law uh, in which even if there is limited enforcement or there are violations, no one would think that the law doesn't exist. Right? I, I was going to talk about, say, voting rights in Georgia. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. That's on my Twitter feed of late. <clears throat> but generally, people are allowed to vote. Are, are, most of the time, most places, most polling sites, you can vote. Are there, have there been uh, significant efforts to, to suppress vote and, and limit voting and mis... Yes, those, both those truths simultaneously are accurate. And what we have to do is sort out exactly what's happening. Uh, international law, I think, is just... A, a, is that assertion is true to a greater degree. International law, there's no international police force per se. Ergo, the incentives and disincentives that lead states to abide by international law are not as clear as what keeps me from shoplifting at the 7-Eleven. I mean, my mama said it wasn't a good idea, but I think I might get caught and, you know, all the, right, and there will be a police and I'll get arrested, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, but, but, and then on the point, which I think is important in terms of the uh, uh, value of international law and the current moment that we're living, one of the things about the United States, which is interesting, is as much as I think we've established that the United States does not accept that it is bound by international law, you know, in the famous litigation in Nicaragua, the United States refused to participate uh, in litigations in the 1980s when the United States was mining the harbors of Nicaragua in violation of international law. Nicaragua took the matter to the International Court of Justice, and the United States decided we're just not going to participate. I mean, that's sort of a black and white example of gee, there's international law, there's a body that enforces it, you are bound and you decide not to implement. But there are many, many others. What's interesting and, which, and what complicates the analysis is that even though the United States doesn't really believe itself in its heart of hearts, I would say, to be bound by international law, it does go generally through the motions of analyzing international law across the board uh, to, to, and, to, and tries to argue that it, it is in compliance as much as possible. So it does do that even when it is not in compliance, a, 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 with the exception of the last few years where we're moving away even from feeling bound to analyze international law and assert that we're in compliance with it. But the United States also, whether this is hypocritical or not, presses other states frequently to respect international law. It does that. Even though states could say, yeah, but, but you don't follow international law, and maybe they whisper that in their bilateral relation with the United States. They will listen to the United States, and they will uh, take measures to, to be in greater compliance with international law in ways that are of interest to the United States. And then now, turn to, to, to the Trump era, you have a government, you have your Trump administration, that is actively telling other states, don't worry about international law, be nationalist, uh, right, this is the last speech in the United Nations that, that, that Trump gave, mm -hmm. you know, not, uh, nods and winks to, to not just nationalism, but to uh, conflict with international law as an accept acceptable method of governance. And then you have the, you know, abuses in my area in human rights that I look at where you have Duterte in, in the Philippines getting a, a nod and a wink, and, and others who are committing grave human rights abuses, Saudi Arabia getting a nod and a wink, in ways that even if it was hypocritical, in previous administrations it was more likely, not absolutely certain, that the United States would engage its moral authority to critique states actively violating core human rights norms. Mm -hmm. So that's where um, we are. And can I just say, and <clears throat> I want to pick up on your comments about international law because it's fragile. It, the, the con I mean, to me, we're at a, a fragile moment now in the United States and the world. Um, I don't want to get too alarmist, but I'm going to be alarmist because it sounds, it feels to me like 1931. Mm -hmm. and, and by that I mean, if you look around the world, look at what's happening now in Brazil, 
where a, a basically a fascist is about to take over as leader of the, the biggest country in, in Latin America. In Poland and in Hungary, you have far-right governments, you have far-right movements spreading all throughout Western Europe, from England and UKIP to the National Front in France, to the Five Star Movement in Italy, to Austria and Greece, look at Turkey. Um, a lot of those movements all across Europe are supported covertly by Putin and the Russians who, who see an angle for blowing up the EU and the Western alliance and, and getting an opening for Russia. You have the Chinese and the Indians and the Japanese all in different ways uh, adopting ultra-nationalist governments or, or, or worse. Um, and, and I don't know where this is all going. I know that Steve Bannon is skulking all around Western Europe trying to build and unite all these far-right movements, certainly in alliance with Trump and Corey Lewandowski and David Bossy and the people who are Trump's inner circle, the real cabinet that we have in this country. Um, and so it's a scary moment globally and international law could crumble um, and fall apart if, you know, if um, we aren't vigilant. And by we, I mean the global citizenry aren't vigilant about what could happen. And we could suddenly find ourselves back in the the era of, you know, the bullies of 1920s and 1930s, where you had, you know, all the leaders of those at that, of that time, um, kind of duking it out and making deals and then fighting with each other, and things fall apart, as somebody has said. So it's a scary moment now. Uh, that comment reminds me of the 19, late 1970s, when it was Jimmy Carter talked about a malaise that was uh, going over the country. And perhaps there's what our panelists are talking about is some kind of, of malaise in the international legal order. At least they're exhibiting a certain malaaise. I'm feeling it's um, it's more than yeah. malaise. It's, <coughs> it's it's real meanness. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, it's, but there's a sense. What I'm talking about is the sense that we feel, and you know, it's your judgment that that's the case. You might uh, talk to others who have a different perspective. Those in the U.S. State Department, for example, might have a different do have a different interpretation in the Nicaragua case and the legality of pulling out of that. A case, you know, it was a juris complex jurisdictional matter, and they had complex arguments, their arguments about that. So, uh, but there is nonetheless a malaise, and there is, in, in, in the view of our panelists, uh, something more than that. Um, Amelia, uh, his comments remind me of, I believe it was Lewis Hankin who said that uh, most countries comply with most international law most, most of the most time, time, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, but you might amend that. Uh, in light of our comments, uh, that uh, except for the United States, is, is is that the case? Is that the case? Oscar Schachter, on the other hand, talked about the autonomy of law, and, and even pressed the case that the law has some autonomous force, including international law, even with regard to the United States. So, are we saying that there is some international law, except with the, with the United States? Is that an element of, a, of U.S. exceptionalism? There is some international law, except with the United States. Is that, that fair to how we're saying? And let, let me ask Amelia to comment on that. So it's your question, do we have international law, but there is this element for the United States to be exceptional? Usually when, when I look at international courts, and these are to me embodiments, like institutionalized international law, who doesn't support them? Powerful states. Because they feel like, oh, well, why do I need law if I really can use my power? And if I can sign bilateral agreements with states that will say, we won't take you to the International Criminal Court. So in a way, yes, we have international law, and smaller powers care about international law more. Because why? Mm -hmm. The principal um, norm of international law is the sovereign equality of states. So who is going to enjoy that norm? Those that in, in reality are not granted that. The powerful states, most of the time, want to feel above, want to feel a little better. So who is going to um, take advantage of international courts? Those that want to seek justice that's otherwise not granted to them. Now, that might be an idealistic uh, way to think about it, but I think the recent rhetoric of policymakers from the United States um, that really makes the international, calls international courts 
global bureaucracy, illegitimate. We're going to let you die on its own. Or uh, it's going to be a cold day in hell before United States uh, supports the International Criminal Court. These are some strong, really strong words. I understand even when powerful states are saying, well, we disagree with the jurisdiction, at least use a nice rhetoric. <laughs> at least, mm -hmm. at, at mm -hmm. least be um, civilized. But when we are saying that a court that's supportive um, of fights against um, genocide, crimes against humanity, butchering people illegally, when we're saying that institution is illegitimate, that makes me think that unfortunate nowadays, yes, there is international law, and then there is United States. Is it the United States, though? Each of you talk about the United States, right? As, as if it's a singular entity. But in fact, there are different actors in the federal government. Um, and there's one actor uh, <laughs> that has <laughs> a particular uh, point of view and that is influencing things, I think, <laughs> along the lines of what we're saying. Um, and that, that brings in the question, uh, is it this moment? Is it a 1930s moment that where we're going to come out of it? Uh, another famous person talked about the arc of justice, ar arc of history bending towards justice. Uh, does it? No. D J Jim. Uh, I'll say it doesn't. I, I just one point on the last, on the last issue uh, about international law. I would say it's also true of the United States, the Lou Hankin quote, that most countries follow most international law most of the time. That is true of the United States. What I think is different about the United States, and where you can draw a, a, a distinction, American exceptionalism, is that the United States uh, refuses in certain ma matters, in certain areas, even to pay lip service to international law. So the United States won't ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child. It's alone, effectively, on the planet in that distinction. Not really much of a distinction. when you say the United States, what do you mean? I mean the United States government. But so ju it has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The State Department, the you know the the, the Bricker Amendment, right, uh, and and the ghost of the Bricker Amendment. So just some history is, remarkably, in uh, 1950, a court in California, uh, in a case called Fuji, uh, decided that the Alien Land Law of California, which did not allow Japanese nationals to own land, it decided that that norm, that law, violated the law of the United States through application of the Supremacy Clause. And the Supremacy Clause is a clause that says treaties ratified by the United States are the supreme law of the land. And the treaty that that California court applied was the United Nations Charter, which has general statements about equality and non-discrimination. And that's called self-execution. Maybe your lawyers, maybe you're not. Which means self-execution just means a court can read a treaty and say this treaty has terms that are bound, that bind rather authorities in the United States, and they execute by themselves. So that someone can come in to a court and say, hey, the United States ratified this treaty. It says no non-discrimination. I'm a Japanese national. I want to buy this parcel of land. I should be allowed to, to, to buy that. Okay? So that's the state of the laws in, in 1950. Long story short, a senator named Bricker proposed an amendment to the, to the United States Constitution which would have made it virtually impossible for the United States government to ratify tra treaties. All 48 at the time states would have had to, uh, by their legislatures, approve the treaty and then Congress would have to pass implementing legislation, okay? The Bricker Amendment lost by one vote, one vote, one vote. But it, the political deal that Eisenhower cut so that the Bricker Amendment wouldn't be passed, the political deal was that the United States would not ratify human rights treaties. And all of this, all of this is about the governing coalition at that time and the strength of Dixiecrats in the South and their opposition to any international meddling in uh, Jim Crow, <coughs> right, in, and uh, unequal education, uh, federal anti-lynching statutes, et cetera. Okay, so sorry about that sort of detailed narrative, but it's important because U.S. policy since then has effectively implemented the Bricker Amendment without ratifying the Brooker Amendment, which is to say that the United States does not allow treaties that are ratified to have value in the United States. You can't sue on the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, even though the United States has ratified it. You can't go into court and say, hey, the United States has promised it ratified the, I, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and my rights have been violated with regard to this article. I want the court 
to rule on this, to assess the facts and rule. It won't happen. But that's the so, same. That's the same in other countries, isn't it? It's, treaties it, are not self-executing. I mean, we're it getting depends on the country. Same. Yeah, there's a case. There's a case right the now country. in it, it, the Iranians thought of something very clever <coughs> when when Trump pulled out of the Iran agreement, which, by the way, I spent a lot of time reporting on how that came to be and went to Iran and everything else. Iran has now taken the United States to court in the International Court of Justice, claiming that under the 1955 U.S.-Iran friendship agreement. Um, uh, not to mention that we put the government in power when we brought the Shah back in back then, um, that the sanctions are illegal, that it's a, that's the unilateral sanctions now that Trump wants to impose are illegal under that 1955 <laughs> act. And I guess it's not going to get too far, but who knows? It's a clever, it's a clever thing. But I, I wanted to say there are things, you know, you mentioned the actor. I assume you meant the, the guy in the White House. But Congress, has, different a, actors in one. Congress yeah. has a role to play. Um, there's, a th there's a whole history involving the Leahy law about, or the Leahy rules about yeah. human rights uh, amendments that prevent the United States from arming units overseas that commit human rights violations. It's been applied poorly. Uh, it isn't strong enough. Uh, they've left Israel out of this for some unknown reason. Um, but. There's also the Magnitsky Act. Now, do you know the history of that, right? In, in, two, in 2012, when um, a lawyer was murdered or killed, allowed to die in Russian prison, um, they, Congress passed the Magnitsky Act, which allowed sanctions on, I think, now almost four dozen Russians. It's been expanded over the years, um, which really is painful sanctions, barring them from travel, seizing assets, doing all kinds of things. Then four years later, they passed the Global Magnitsky Act. Um, just last week, that, by the way, that allowed the president or the State Department to sanction human rights violators anywhere in the world um, if either the State Department decides they deserve it or if Congress recommends it. So when Jamal Khashoggi was chopped to pieces in the Saudi embassy or the consulate in Turkey, uh, 11 Democrats and 11 Republicans in, in the Senate have now sent a letter to President Trump saying, we want you to sanction the people responsible for this under the Global Magnitsky Act. And the, and the President has 120 days from the receipt of that letter um, to decide whether he is going to sanction um, the people found uh, guilty. And they said, you know, even up to the top levels of the Saudi government, meaning the, the king Perfect. and the prince. So why, why am I saying all this? Because you all have a role to play in this. There's a check and a balance involving what the United States does overseas. Uh, <coughs> Congress can act. When, when we vote in 10 days or whatever it is, that's going to affect what Congress then can further do to constrain what the administration is able to do. Um, maybe there are more Magnitsky acts to pass. There's a lot of things that can happen. Um, in, in the checks and balances of our system that would allow us to affect what we do overseas. And we have to start asking questions. What in the world are we doing in Syria? Does anybody know what we're doing in Syria? There's no more ISIS. Even if there was ISIS, by the way, it wasn't a threat to us. ISIS was not a national security threat to the United States. We have no justification in the first place for, you know, we've carried out Thousands of bombing raids in Syria in the past five years. Thousands and thousands of bombing raids. I don't know what happened to Raqqa. Nobody knows. I don't know what happened in Mosul in Iraq when those cities fell to the uh, Iraqi government in one case and in Syria to the Kurdish forces supported by the United States. But what are we doing there? We don't have any right to be in Syria. There's, there's a government in Syria that has asked the Russians to come in and help, has asked Iran to come in and help. That's their sovereign right as the government of Damascus to retake their territory from a rebellion that was supported by the Saudis and, and lots of other people. What are we doing there? And we're still there, and we're still bombing Syria. Right, and we still have a military base there. I, I appreciate your point, though, that Congress has a role. And that was my point, that there, 
The United States is not just a, a monolith. And Congress can cut off funding for and that. The people, the, the people who elect Congress and also the, 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 the president. And, and, and so things can change. It's, 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 of what I'm getting at. I, I'd be interested in, in, in Amelia, your, your take on my question, which Bob already gave his answer. Does the, is the, or does the, do we have hope in some sense? Is, does the arc of history bend toward justice so that you know, we can see this as a moment that uh, could pass at least? Well, I certainly hope so. Um, but I want to comment um, on something that Bob said with regards to the International Court of Justice and Iran suing United States saying, Look, you know, you need to ease the sanctions. And guess what? On the 5th of October, the International Court of Justice spoke and said, you, United States, are supposed to uh, do exemptions for experts of humanitarian and civil aviation. <coughs> and the decision was unanimous. Right. And United States asked um, one judge to be an ad hoc judge on the court. And th that judge that the United States appointed so even looked at the United States and said, yeah, you're wrong, you know, unanimous decision. And the this judge is- judge appointed by the United yes, States. Yes, said, you're exactly. wrong, you're violating the law. And what happened? John Bolton criticized the International Court of Justice saying, you are politicized, you are ineffective. This is completely pointless. And Iran responded, United States is turning into outlaw regime. You know, <laughs> I mean, this is a strange world we're yeah. living in. And the, another idea that um, Bolton had, well, what we will do, we will analyze all of the treaties that the United States is part of that give jurisdiction to International Court of Justice, and we're going to put a reservation. We're going to start protecting ourselves. So, reservation from jurisdiction? Yes, mm -hmm. to withdraw, completely um, isolate the International Court of Justice. So back to your question, are we in this moment that uh, we can turn around from? I hope so. I think that it's just a phase because, as I said before, international law emerged from state practice. Um, I still see the violations and the uh, really uncalled for critiques of, of international courts as being limited to a handful of states because majority of the states still respect those institutions. And I think that the really um, straightforward negative rhetoric towards institutions like International Criminal Court or International Court of Justice makes majority of the world cringe, saying, really? Right. Uh, Jim, you had a comment. So I'd like com to open it up. Uh, on that question, is just the last bit. So, uh, and this is uh, my sanguine side coming up. Uh, I, I, you know, I work in human rights, so I have to be an eternal optimist. Right? Long ago, would have found a tall building and <laughs> leapt. Uh, so here's where I see a confluence of potential factors that can bring about a dynamic uh, in which international law can expand and increase. So first, one of the things that I think we're witnessing in real time is, as I think we've all uh, hinted at or stated, a degradation of the conventions in this country and a degradation of core principles of rule of law within the United States. Uh, an excessive role played by the executive, uh, a, a complicity of Congress, et cetera. Uh, I, I flag that because if you, and this is what I do, because uh, I work mostly outside of the United States and I've lived out of the United States for 20 or 30, 30 years. Countries that go through uh, periods of exception, of authoritarian rule, of denigration of core values of human rights and democracy, often afterwards, in some transitional period, uh, ratify and recognize international law, sort of as a, as a backstop, as a recognition that our laws, our traditions, our customs, our conventions were not sufficient to prevent us from this uh, exceptional period, maybe a period of uh, atrocity and abuse. So we need to lock in some other set of values. So I'm hopeful, as much as you know, it sticks in the craw of most Americans to think of anything international and anything beyond our Supreme Court. I think the Supreme Court has, has lost a lot of stature. The last month, not sure exactly when. Uh, <laughs> lost some stature. So I think there's hope, that, hope there. And then second, secondarily, one of the things that, that Trump has done, not necessarily intentionally, maybe intentionally, he's weak in the United States and the world. He's weak in the United States and the world. 
Now, one of the consequences of the United States being weakened in the world, if you look historically, and your point is absolutely, I'm entirely in, in, in agreement, states that press for rule of law internationally tend to be smaller states and democratic states. They want a rules-based system. They do not want the law of the jungle. Mm -hmm. As the United States loses power globally, I think there will be a confluence of factors. The idea of we need to have some norms above ours or incorporate them because our norms failed us in this historical period. And two, as the playing field becomes more level and there's not a single uh, uh, monolithic power on the planet, the United States, I think there will be greater interest in the United States. And then the last thing I would say is, I have enormous faith because I have to in, in youth in this country. And in the past few years, if you look, just to pick something, not international treaty ratification or the role of the United States in the world, but just something on which the jury was clear, single payer health care, never, right? Because the Democrats and the Republicans both oppose it. Look at, look at polls on single payer health care. And I think increasingly in the United States, you will see that polls on where people actually position themselves are quite different from what the major parties are, are advocating for. Mm -hmm. And I think an international law-based, rules of law system, a justice-based system, I think you would find in increasing interest, particularly among young people, and I think there's hope for the future. So that's my mm -hmm. sanguine upbeat. It's 1931, but maybe we come out of it without so having to go through 39 to 45. We have, we have some time for some questions from <laughs> the audience. Uh, a couple of folks uh, with microphones, so if you could raise your hand and uh, just wait for the microphone so everybody can hear you each well. The woman on the second row here. could have been done um, in the creation of an international, of international law norms to strengthen them so that they in turn could uh, help strengthen the, the post-war liberal order. It's, it's kind of asking what could we have done better yes. to make international law stronger I, I believe that international law would have been better off had the Western powers included non-Western states in its creation so that we would have more consensus. Yes. I think it's, it's a really basic mechanism. If you create something, you like it. And, and, and you're more likely to listen to it if you participate in making of those rules. Um, and I think another thing that could have been done better is to recognize the historical contribution of non-Western states to international law. Because what I hired a student to do the work for me. I said, go and analyze all of the English, spe English language international law textbooks, whether Islamic international law is mentioned. I think we analyzed 30. There's only one, and it's usually a footnote. By the way, blah, blah, blah. So uh, as if we're acting that we are the smartest, we are the better, um, and nobody else contributed anything, um, but I think the spirit of welcoming others or recognizing others would have been very helpful. Bob? Yeah, well, don't forget when Franklin Roosevelt and company were kind of putting together the UN idea during World War II and, and afterwards with Truman and so forth, um, the British and the French insisted that nothing be done that would undermine the British or French empires worldwide. And they wanted to maintain their colonial power, right? Which meant that all of the countries outside of, you know, in Africa and Asia and so on were were shut out. They didn't exist. They weren't even going to be countries. And many of them didn't become countries until the 1970s, even, like in, in the Persian Gulf. So, you know, I mean, this was a haphazard thing that came together. Um, I was just reading this book called The Internationalists by two Yale law professors, um, I think Steve Shapiro and Una Hathaway. And they talk about the peace pact that was signed in 1928, designed to outlaw war. Uh, 
and then how that fell apart in the 1930s, but then kind of got resurrected after World War II and became embodied in the UN and the various concepts of international law and peacekeeping and things like that we had since then. It's, it's been a hit and miss effort and it's still going on. So I don't think it's a question of what could we have done in the past differently, but what, what do we do now? How do we approach this now? And I think a lot of people are thinking about that stuff, including in other countries outside the West. Um, unfortunately, there aren't too many democracies um, outside the West, so um, it's going to take you know, the remaining ones to, to speak up and, and make their voices heard. I'm afraid the democracies are shrinking and not you know, gaining. Jim? So I'll engage with the counterfactual and not to point the finger again at the United States, but if, if you, there's a really interesting text by Carol Anderson uh, where she analyzes the role of the United States in the negotiations in the formation of the United Nations. And one of the things that the United States did uh, really to, to hamstring, if not to, if not to cripple, the human rights oversight machinery of the United Nations was the thing called the Domestic Jurisdiction Clause, uh, which basically, uh, provides broad, broad cover for states to be exempt from any kind of engagement in matters that are deemed to be within the domestic jurisdiction. So basically, stay out. And that was opposed by uh, most states that were drafting uh, the UN Charter. But the United States insisted, and it was driven, by the way, like most things in United States politics, uh, driven by domestic politics, and in particular, driven by race relations in the Deep South, but throughout the United States. And the United States' grave concern about being shown to be, in effect, an apartheid state uh, on the international uh, stage. And because it didn't want that, it hamstrung slash constrained the United Nations. Yeah. Stalin so, wasn't too happy about that idea either. Stalin wasn't too happy about that either. But, but uh, small and Western European states and the states that were involved, there was a majority. And the United States ins insisted, this is not going through. We're going to have a domestic jurisdiction clause. We're going to limit the, the, the scope of the United Nations engagement, oversight, and human rights because we, do, we don't want this. So the United States history is it's not, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt, we celebrated, nice, great, super, happy, shiny view. Scratch me at the surface and you see that the United States was involved in some really sordid negotiations at that time. And the other thing I would say, pick up your point, is you know, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the vote was unanimous. 48 states in favor, zero against, eight abstentions. Okay? 56 states total. It's 190 states in the, in the world now. So two thirds of the world was not engaged at all, f you know, future states that were colonies at the time. So there was clearly a deficit and that, that I think there's a, that's legitimate. It is also unfortunately leveraged by uh, non-Western uh, governments that are often authoritarian because they're not particularly keen on having robust international human rights oversight in their countries. So again, it's complicated. It's illegitimate in its Western origins, but what's Western about you shouldn't torture people that you're objecting to here, right? Um, yes, okay. That's what John Yu said. Did you hang on for Sorry. the... You didn't mention the International Court of The Hague. The International Court of Justice. That's the yes. Court of Justice. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. It's in the Hague, so we often refer to it as as the the Hague Court. Interestingly, um, yeah. they have the Grotius Center there, and um, he's the father of international law, quote unquote. But he was like, he was kind of a corrupt guy who justified predatory um, wars and torture and execution of civilians and looting and everything else. So he wasn't exactly Mr. Peace, but his statue is standing there in Delft and his, his I think his, his medallion sits over the House of Representatives in Washington too. So the father of international law left some things to be But well, there's decided. a lot of history in international law. International law developed to justify colonialism, for example, right. and the occupation of the Americas and so forth. So that's a whole in, in your area. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, in the back there, we, uh, did we have someone over? Yes, right here. Well, so um, I uh, study political science here at CU, and the great hope was that eventually these multinational corporations, you know, would unite the world. I mean, we have Starbucks and Milano, right? And so, I mean, uh, what comments on? It looks like we have two things going on: nationalism, right? Maybe brought on by immigration, uh, in large part, perhaps, and also. How do you see uh, 
multinational corporations may be uniting the world in light of the, the nationalistic tendencies. That's the Coca-Cola theory. Yeah. 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 I'd like to buy the world of Coke. <laughs> uh, the song, you know, remember the song? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the big, one of the big, the big trends happening in the world, right? The, the shift from the West to the rising East, the issue of climate change, the questions, all those big issues, the immigration and refugees. So the issue of non-state actors is one of the, the things that always comes up. And one of those, you know, when people think of non-state actors, they think of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. But there's also Facebook. Um, Facebook has 50% uh, more people than China does in its, in its uh, umbrella now, right? 2.2 billion Facebook subscribers. Um, I'm not a believer in um, the unchecked power of multinationals. Um, they, they do transcend national borders, for sure. Um, but I think I would argue in a, in a negative way, um, because the ability to slosh money around, to have um, Chinese investment in American industries and vice versa, and, and Russian banks laundering money through Deutsche Bank into New York real estate people. I won't name any names. Um, <laughs> this, this whole issue of unchecked corporate greed and power and, and exercise of, um, you know, sort of bigness is, is a really scary thing that no national government has quite figured out how to get a hand on. Yeah, and, and, and a knock-on comment, it's, it, it, part of it is figured out a way to get a hand on, but think about the negotiations between a major multinational corporation, whether it's an extractive industry or it's Facebook, with uh, a small government in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. Those are not equal negotiations. And so, the, the, and a friend of mine work, does a lot of work on this, and, and he's actually, from a human rights perspective, works with small states to try to uh, balance to some, to some extent the negotiations with powerful multinationals. I think the sort of the, the one-liner response is the world has been globalized for corporations. International capital travels freely around the world. People can't. People, right? People from, people, you know, uh, several thousand refugees fleeing extreme violence in Honduras. I do a lot of work in Honduras. They're fleeing gangs. They're fleeing really terrible situations where, you know, most folks here look like they're old enough to have uh, kids and you know, maybe some grandkids. Imagine you've got a 13-year-old, 14-year-old who's in high school and is now is going to have to uh, choose either to join a gang uh, or to be threatened with extreme violence and maybe death by the members of that gang. Or maybe if it's a girl, she's going to have to be some gang member's uh, uh, girlfriend or she's going to face a uh, group rape. And Th those folks are moving up into the United States and they're being threatened with, uh, you know, uh, the, the United States military force. While no one is questioning the right of multinational corporations to invest money, as you mentioned, Chinese capital in, right, in, in the United States, in Africa, Russian capital in New York, et cetera. So I, I, I think the answer, unfortunately, which is very difficult, is regulation of multinational corporations. And there are soft treaties that move in this direction. It's a developing area of law, but I think what you need to have, and it's hard to do this, is to get states to uh, raise the level of obligations on multinationals instead of what they tend to do, race to the bottom. We will give you better perks. We will have fewer laws. We will have fewer regulations. You can pay a dollar an hour here. Please come invest here. That's been the unfortunate grand narrative of the past several decades. If we flip that, there, I think there would be... Is there an argument that the U.S. has been a leader in that? I think there's an argument that the United States has been, has been a clear leader, leader since the 1970s. Uh, if you read James Peck on this, another... I don't know why we're only citing Yale professors today. Aside uh, <laughs> from some Stanford and Colorado and elsewhere. We cited Jim, Jim and I. He's Go Buffs. Go Buffs. Uh, <laughs> but from the 70s, the United States, because at the time... It had, and it still has, some of the leading multinational corporations. It was clearly in the United States' interest uh, 
to open borders for trade. Right. Free, free trade is advantageous if you have the most developed capitalist system, the best developed uh, industries, uh, the highest level of techn technological sophistication, the best universities. If that's who you are, let's free trade. Because uh, you know, if you're selling me bananas and I'm selling you computers, I win. Well, it's been pretty right? good for uh, China, though. <clears throat> Like well, to, yeah, like to they played the game well. They played the game well. Let Amelia have a <coughs> on this question if she wants. Well, I was thinking about what does it mean for uh, the world peace or, for, or rule of law or what is the contribution of the fact that different countries trade with each other, that we have Starbucks in Algeria or... Uh, so first time I went to Gloria Cafe was when I, when I was doing interviews in Sharia College of, of Law in United Arab Emirates. And I thought, oh, that seems weird. Um, I traveled to Oman over the summer, and that really blew my mind. When I walk into a store, uh, like an equivalent of a mall, and I see a Polish toy store that's called Smik in Arabic. And I thought... <laughs> <laughs> It's not even um, American or, or British or French, it's, it's Polish. I took this picture and I sent it to my parents who live in Poland. I said, isn't that strange? But I think the question that, that we need to ponder is, what does it mean for the way that we communicate with each other? Or what does it mean for international law? Uh, does it bring peace? Does it make us more similar? I think there are limits to this. I don't think that having Gloria Cafe in Sharia College of Law or Polish toy store in Omani Mall makes us more similar. I think there are limits to which we can, we can be similar, to which we can agree to agree on a similar set of norms. Because with this kind of throwing of businesses all around the world comes this, I think, pushback, oh, I'm different, you know, there are limits um, to which I'm going to accept uh, certain norms that that business promotes. Mm -hmm. We have another in the back there. Thank you. My name is Miklina, and I'm an, an alumni of CU Boulder. I'm originally from South Sudan, the newest nation and a member to the UN. And my question was like going to Emilia. I wanted to ask what is the international court viewpoint in regards to the newest country, South Sudan, in regards to killing its own, her own people, raping women, and committing genocide, supported by the neighboring countries like Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Khartoum. Is there anything that the International Court is talking about or planning to do something? If yes, I would love to know that. And if not, then do you have any idea what the diaspora community or the people going through all these bad acts should do in order to ring the bell. Thank that you. Was directed to you, Emilio. I think that um, we always have to ponder a question: Why conflicts in certain parts of the world make the news so quickly, and why conflicts elsewhere are not heard about? Um, unfortunately there is this intermingling of politics and rule of law um, on the global level that makes some conflict immediately in the news and immediately the focus of international outrage and some are swept under the rug. Um, I'm hoping that that conflict is going to, and those violations of human rights are going to be put on the table of international courts. And again, 
you probably know a whole lot more than I do with the, about the politics involved with the neighboring countries. I do want to tell you that the emergence of South Sudan as an independent country made several African countries very happy. I just flew back from Algeria, and the first um, information that I got, well, you know, Algeria is the biggest country in Africa ever since <laughs> South Sudan <laughs> gained independence. Mm -hmm. But I would like to hear from the other panelists. More to your question. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to how to get the world to pay attention. I'm, I draw a complete blank on that. I, I, I have no clue. Um, I will say that one of the byproducts of rising nationalism around the world, whether it's Trump-style nationalism or British-style, let's leave the EU nationalism, uh, or even uglier forms in other parts of the world, is, a, a, to me, a troubling kind of um, sub-nationalism that, that worries me. Um, you can't have every tribe and ethnic group have its own country. You can't have the Kurds create a state out of Turkey, Iraq, and Syria, and Iran, by the way, and expect not to create 50 years of war. That's what will happen if Kurd Kurdistan becomes independent. It'll be a a 50-year-long catastrophe and a genocide. Um, I don't know anything about the justification for South Sudan, but I don't think it was a good idea to have that country come into existence. I don't think Eritrea was a good idea to split off from Ethiopia just because it's Muslim and the Ethiopians are Christian. And you can further break up countries all over the world. That's happening in Europe. Uh, look what happened in Yugoslavia with hundreds of thousands of people dead with the creation of little mini-states that, I, I don't know, I know that the Slovenians and the Croatians are really excited about it and the, the Macedonians are thrilled, but I, I, I think there's a, at a certain point, it's just not a good idea to have all these countries break up and then break up again and then break up again. <laughs> Um, and that's, uh, unfortunately, what can happen if um, people don't put a reasonable check on the creation of many states. And it's, it's a worrisome trend to me. I'm sorry. Jim, would you like to? D just on the last point, <coughs> <I'll> counterpoint, <coughs> the international law rule about states and the acceptance of the largely arbitrary uh, national boundaries that we've inherited historically is a clear rule. I accept generally on the whole it probably reduces carnage. That said, uh, there's a, a, a large dose of, of hypocrisy uh, that goes into those who have crafted states in, a, in, in accordance with their ethnic and religious uh, and geographical preferences, uh, setting the, uh, the, the rules for others who have been subject to colonial rule and have not had the opportunity to create states in ways that might be more coherent. So I just at least want to problematize, since we're in an academic uh, setting, th that assertion. Well, to further problematize, there are rules now protecting minorities uh, within states, groups that are. There are, so, that's yeah, true. To further problematize. But you know, Iraq. Um, before 2003, did you know that one-third of Iraqis were intermarried? That Sunnis married Shiites, that Shiites married Kurds, that Kurds married Sunnis, Sunni Arabs, that is. And, because uh, the Kurds are mostly Sunnis. Um, a third of Iraqis were intermarried. When we decapitated the country and disbanded the army and the police force and the Ba'ath Party, and created an ultimate power vacuum in that country, um, then people resorted to tribalism. And the country began to divide itself. And then you had people like 
Joe Biden making outrageous proposals to break up Iraq and make three states out of it. I mean, Joe Biden is so ridiculously ignorant about Iraq that I can't even, I'll sputter if I think about it. Um, well, I think we're, we're running out of time on that. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm a Joe Biden fan necessarily, not that I'm not. Poor Joe. Uh, we, this is getting us in, in, in somewhat into a, a different, very thorny area, um, which, I, which may be a great topic for the next panel. So with that, I'd like to thank our panelists for a terrific conversation. Thank all of you for coming.